Hello, and thanks for inviting me to the 2014 European Meetings on Cybernetics and Systems Research. Um, a very interesting, especially a very diverse uh, collection of conferences. I'm Stuart Armstrong from the Future of Humanity Institute, and I'm presenting a talk on total surveillance and why the solution to too many cameras spying on everyone might be a lot more cameras spying on even more everyone. Right, um, at the Future of Humanity Institute we like to focus on the important issues. Uh, why? Well, because they are important. Um, that's a glib answer, but the real reason is because they can sometimes be very important. Um, this is Fritz Haber, one of the creator of the Haber-Bosch process. He could also be considered the father of chemical warfare, uh, so probably has a few million deaths on his conscience. However, in the grand scheme of things, this balances out to the positive, because he created the Haber-Bosch process, which um, is used to create the fertilizers with which we feed the world today. Um, about half the world's food, at the very least, um, is created through an extension of the Haber-Bosch process. So whatever negatives he's done, he's probably saved at least three billion lives. On a more positive note, here is uh, Borlaug, the father of the Green Revolution. It, these are hard to estimate, but at least about 250 million lives saved, and are the reasons why Mexico and India um, can feed themselves to some extent today. Um, also is Jenner, the creator of the smallpox vaccine, and he other accounts for another half billion lives saved. So solving the important problems can result in a disproportionate impact upon the world. Um, a retort to this is, shouldn't we solve all issues uh, from the most important to the less important? Well, ideally, yes, we would want to solve that. There is an opportunity cost. We can't focus on every single problem at once. Um, so if we don't focus on the most important, we're diluting our efforts. In the 1920s, Haber searched exhaustively for a method to extract gold from seawater. Now, okay, he'd already achieved his biggest uh, objective, uh, the Haber-Bosch process. But imagine if he'd wasted his time on gold from seawater instead of doing that. So that would have been a colossal waste to the world. So an issue that we consider possibly um, a bit of a waste here is privacy. Now privacy is intrinsically important, there's no doubt about that. But it's not vitally important compared with some of the other issues I'll present in this talk today. Um, so when I see work on privacy, um, the question is always, is this work useful for bigger problems? And sometimes it is, but sometimes it's just a diversion and a waste of resources. So, so what can we say about surveillance? Um, surveillance is changing, we have a lot of evidence for that, but why? Well, the main reason is technological change. Moore's law applies in a lot of different domains. Um, this is one example. This traces the decreasing, the exponentially decreasing price of cameras and other recording equipments. Um, these things are getting cheaper. They're getting cheaper at an exponential rate. Drones, cameras, all the enablers of surveillance technology are getting much cheaper and much easier. Uh, in a world where surveillance drone would cost a dollar, and this world will come, um, the situation will be completely different from the current world or for the one of 10 years ago. Um, we've estimated that by the mid-2020s, the richer countries could put their, um, their citizenship under 24-hour surveillance if they felt like it. By the mid-2030s, even the poorest countries would be able to do this. Um, the last country able to do that would be Zimbabwe. Um, so, uh, there's other trends that are helping this. Um, data is getting more and more easy to de-anonymize. Uh, Netflix a few years ago published 
um, some of its data anonymized a small selection of a small group of its data and thoroughly anonymized one of the groups that got this found it relatively easy to de-anonymize it just using freely available online information and to assign accounts to names um, similarly they did a study of mobile phones and found that from in a small country with about a million subscribed on the mobile phones if you had four locations you could pinpoint who who was the owner of that mobile phones so like if you had tweeted four times and included location information in your four tweets that would be enough to uniquely identify you um, anonymous um, genetics database uh, online can be analyzed and surnames can be recovered from the Y chromosome and once you have the surname it's uh, not that hard to figure out who the actual person might be um, and there's a reason for this because there's a tension between the data being anonymous and the tension and the data being useful generally speaking if you want it to be reliably anonymous you've stripped it down so much that it's nearly entirely useless. This is a report I lifted from a sample medical report online. It goes on for a long time, there's a lot more details. The point is almost every single one of these details is relevant uh, for various research. The age of the subject, um, his parents, uh, past diagnosis, all of these are useful if you want to spot a pattern or test a theory, except that of course all these details are very de-anonymizing um, and to, for this to be really anonymous it would probably be completely devoid of any data whatsoever. The tech progress has continued uh, and it mostly all militates against privacy rather than favor. For instance, your phone can be tracked online by minute errors in the phone's accelerometers. Um, even if you completely anonymize your phone, use whatever uh, systems you want to have no cookies, all those things there, your phone can still be tracked by just intrinsic flaws within it. And uh, as uh, this is an example that Bruce Schneider's used and again there's always novel ways of de-anonymizing, of linking people to databases, of breaking down privacies, and there's very few novel ways of ensuring privacy. But all this pales into insignificance with the enthusiasm with people with which people chuck their privacy away for free. Um, surveillance is the business model of the internet. All, if, as the expression goes, if you're not paying for it, you're the product. All the free services, Google, Facebook, Twitter, their entire business model is premised on figuring out your information and selling it. This is the default um, Facebook settings, privacy settings in 2005. This has changed a bit since then. These are now the default ones in 2010. So the only things that are not available by default to the whole world are your contact info and your birthday. Yay. Um, and well, I'd like you to take a second there to think whether you have changed your Facebook privacy settings and if you haven't, whether you are now going to do so and what your thought process is around that. I haven't changed them and it feels too much like a hassle to do so. It's been recently shown that these various free services have collaborated with the NSA, but this is hardly a surprise because they are set up to be surveillance systems. Um, the NSA just basically had to ask them, hey, um, all that information you're gathering already, can we have some of it? Well, with a subpoena and all the legal things, and they said, yes, of course. Um, Google knows more about you than you know yourself, especially about your past. If you want to know what you were thinking a year ago, um, Google will probably have a much clearer idea um, than you do. Um, this is an infographic uh, that sort of uh, put, uh, summarizes this point in a more punchy format. 
Um, and the last barrier was the fact that even if you had cameras pointing at things, you still needed someone behind them to sort of figure out what was being seen. But this last barrier is falling, um, thanks to, well, Facebook again, thank you. Humans have a 97.53 accuracy at face recognition in certain situations. Um, Facebook now has a software called DeepFace, which has a 97.25% accuracy, essentially identical. In the future, your data, your privacy can be invaded and your data can be interpreted just as fast as it can be recorded. Um, and resisting surveillance is very hard. Um, this is an example where um, that demonstrated that even cyber criminals uh, couldn't maintain their privacy online and they were detected through various social media uh, and other uh, methods. Um, they were in Russia so they weren't punished because uh, of the holes in the legal system but they were found out. Um, they didn't even make too many mistakes on their own social uh, media systems um, but they were caught out because they had friends and families who posted their Facebook's photos which included them. So even if you have absolutely perfect security yourself, if you're interacting with other people and they don't have perfect security, well then you, you can be found out. Your details can similarly be found out. Um, another question is how could you know if someone's recording you at the moment or not recording you? Do you actually need to have a camera out there behind the bushes to check that there's no one in the bushes? This seems to completely defeat the point. There's a law of second best uh, in economics and in many other things in life in that if the best option is not available, the second best option may not look like anything like the first one. Surveillance is a possible example of this. The idea is that since people watching you from above, the surveillance, cannot be prevented. Um, instead of stopping it, we respond by looking up, by recording what the overlords are getting up to. Counter cameras with more cameras from below. Um, the advantage of this is that it works with, with the tech change, not against it. Um, all the previous trends that I mentioned um, they fight against conventional uh, privacy, making conventional privacy very hard, um, but surveillance, they work with surveillance. It rides the wave rather than trying to, well, uh, shore up the dike. Um, you're welcome to our data, Mr. NSA. Now let's keep a look at what you're going to do with it. This is a model that seems much more robust to, well, than uh, much more robust than sort of passing privacy laws and counting on governments to enforce the privacy laws against themselves. Um, it also has a certain egalitarian um, aspects against authority. Um, if you just have testimony between uh, someone who isn't in the inside the authority system and someone who isn't, then the testimony of the say the police officer will generally be believed. Um, so in a courtroom, if it comes to he said, she said, and she is a police officer, then the, uh, he doesn't have much of a chance. But if things are being recorded, then the situation is completely different. Um, under surveillance, all interactions with authority figures should be recorded and publicized. And the kind of low-level corruption and abuse of powers uh, that you uh, see, see or have seen all the time will become much harder. Um, this is an example of surveillance, the Occupopter, which Occupy Wall Street used to keep an eye on the police, just as the police were filming the protesters. And I think we should count Snowden as an example of surveillance, uh, because a few years back he would not have been able to steal all the data that he did. It's because of the trends in computing and centralization uh, that he was able to get at so much information and copy it so effectively. Now, ideally you might want to push for privacy and surveillance at the same time, but privacy laws may work against surveillance. Like, this is a famous sort of uh, extract of a film clip uh, about 
uh, JFK just before he got shot, one of the most important moments of the 20th century. Um, but imagine if that lady there had objected to her uh, face being used, and as a consequence of that, this clip was either unavailable or blurred in certain key ways. Um, privacy laws, even for not uh, unimportant, well, not massively important people themselves, can be used to prevent information about very important events, about politicians, about high-level um, corruptions. The, they can be abused in that way. Okay, maybe the Kennedy assassination would be sufficiently important that it could get publicized, whatever the people are in it. Um, but what about sort of less important things? What about Google's boardroom meetings? This is probably some of the most important events affecting our lives and decisions are made here. Well, can we know what the decisions are? Of course not. It's private information. This is the kind of privacy laws that need to be get rid of if you want to have effective surveillance. Let's take another example. Um, suppose some medium level civil servants and business people are talking with each other, so business people that the civil servants are regulating are talking with each other at a strip club. Now there are so many privacy issues around this that any sensible privacy law would completely forbid the recording of this conversation or its dissemination. But this is the kind of thing where low-level corruption happens the most. If we really want to find out what's going on, we have to be willing to record even in these sort of circumstances where the fact of recording may make us uncomfortable. Now, surveillance, which leads to everybody watching everyone, has certain drawbacks. I'll just go through a few minor ones, well, th through a few of them. It's conformity. Um, there does not seem to be a way of setting it up so that you can only look at the important people. It all, uh, you have to set it up so that probably your mother can watch you uh, just as well as the NSA can. This would lead to a certain amount of conformity uh, unless we change our social tolerance. Uh, lack of privacy. For people who strongly value privacy, um, this will be a, a great negative. And not forgetting Things recorded are practically never forgotten. Like in the past, if, say, someone had used an ethnic slur or some expression or expressed some political opinion that was reasonable at the time that they did it but became to be seen as very negative later on, then this would be forgotten. Um, they might even have forgotten it themselves. But nowadays, your opinions are recorded. Would you really want people 30 years from now looking back at the opinions you've expressed today and would you be confident that they would approve of them and that your career might not suffer from something you say today? But there are some expected and unexpected pluses. First of all, crime will likely go down dramatically in a mass surveillance society. Um, current surveillance, which is um, very minor compared with what could be possible is already enough to reduce property crime. Uh, not other types of crime so much, but property crime has been quite well strongly reduced. With cameras everywhere, crime in general will go down. But we could also use it to bring down the police. What need would we have of a large police force if the main enforcement tool was cameras? More to the point, what need would we have of excessive police powers if cameras were the main enforcement tools. All of these photos show police officers um, using their special powers and the main reason uh, that they are allowed or that we allow them to do so is because they don't know stuff. They don't know if the people that they are stopping might be armed or have illegal drugs. They don't know if people are going to if there's drugs in the house that might get flushed down quickly. They don't know what's in the car. Um, but with surveillance replacing the investigation uh, aspects of police, this would all be known and there's no reason to leave the police with the powers um, with any powers beyond say arresting specific people for having committed specific crimes. Now of course the police is not going to voluntarily give up its uh, their powers, but 
So this is something we could push for. Um, the other big plus, of course, research, research. This is a photo of me looking ecstatic while thinking of all the research I could do if I was plugged into all the data of the world. There is a tremendous amount of good and potentially life-saving research that could be done um, with um, mass surveillance and mass availability of the data. Again, privacy laws would fight against this and might block it. Um, another potential issue for emergency responses. If the emergency response arrive at a scene and see this, they have certain strategies uh, for intervention, but imagine that they knew from people's mobile phones that when the, uh, when the disaster hit, this is where everyone was located. Now they can intervene much more effectively and much more rapidly. Um, so positive mass surveillance, so surveillance and surveillance, can be kind of divided into four broad categories. The ones that sort of fight against the state um, or against what the organs of the state would want. The ones that go in their favor, um, like terrorism and crime reductions, emergency services. The ones that sort of substitute for the state, um, like you can reduce the police, um, less bureaucracy. There's we put certain restrictions on free speech uh, because some of the information could be dangerous, like how to build a nuclear bomb. But if we had mass surveillance of all fissile materials, we might prefer to just use the surveillance as a tool to against illicit nuclear weapons and allow people to disseminate information on how to make nuclear bombs perfectly freely in the knowledge that this information will not uh, be misused. And just a few generally good things like enforcement of laws will have to become consistent. Um, commerce may become very easy. You may not need a credit card. Um, if the companies can track who you are at any point, you could just walk into uh, a store, grab something, and the banks and the uh, shop will have it sorted out before you even leave the shop. Anyway, there are a variety of things. But as they say on uh, Sesame Street, some of these things are not like the others. Remember what I said about focusing on the really important issues? Here are two of the most important issues. Because the main important issues uh, with mass surveillance is the positive of reducing existential risk versus the threat of global totalitarianism. Everything else is sort of of much lesser importance than these two extreme threats. For existential risks, well, they are risks that could have a huge, a huge negative impact of great duration. Um, those that could, uh, in the words of Nick Bostrom, the head of the institute, um, wipe out uh, human existence or permanently curtail its potentials. Uh, one of the, uh, the biggest is pandemics, uh, which I mentioned before. Um, these are, if the numbers are somewhat approximate, but these are past events killing over uh, 100 million people. Um, wars are well, uh, well represented. Bad governments are also well represented. Bad governments and certain anarch and lack of governments uh, tend to be quite uh, big killers. But towering above everything else are pandemics and diseases. The biggest killers in human history by far. And there is also the recent risk of synthetic biology, which um, allows people to program human cells, uh, no, sorry, program cells and replicators for specific purposes, or as I prefer to see it, plus human direction. Um, a lot of synthetic biology is in the hand of biohackers, whose main goal is to see all the cool things that they can achieve with um, the machinery of life and other potentially devastating um, pathogens uh, and, uh, and, well, and cells. Um, I hope you're feeling as reassured as I am at this prospect. Uh, so how could different veillances fight against this? Well, if we could detect infections early, that would help tremendously. We could treat and isolate people early, um, which would help um, us and them. Uh, we could model pandemics much better, which would also be of great use. Um, 
Another important thing is that we could check the security of the labs. Lab security, even at the, at the high end, is terrible uh, compared with the potential threat that they pose. The last deaths through, death through smallpox, for instance, came from releases from labs. You think that the, thing, uh, the pathogen that had killed hundreds of millions of people throughout human history would be kept under proper lock and key, but no. And if fighting against synthetic biology by detecting the creation of dangerous pathogens, if someone's doing these manipulations at any particular place. Um, you could also do things like if you can detect where it is, you can do sort of micro quarantines that are sort of impossible to do at the large scale. Now, this veils can also apply to other risks, like for instance, cutting down on nuclear proliferation, which cuts down on the risk of nuclear war. What else? Well, as I said, the main negative impact of surveillance is bad governments. Um, global dictatorships may sound a bit fanciful, but that is the potential great negative of surveillance. Now, there's no doubt that surveillance enables bad governments, the Stasi example, for instance. Um, but it's not clear whether it causes bad governments, whether if you take a decent government and add surveillance, whether you are going to get um, something noticeably worse. Um, first of all, we should discount fictional evidence in any way that counts. If you take 1984 as a prediction, it was wrong. The future did not happen at all the way that Orwell thought it would. Um, you can see from reading some of his essays that he actually thought that 1984 did have a predictive element and those predictive elements were nearly all wrong. Um, so the question is, are more surveilled states more oppressive? Well, I come from Great Britain, one of the most watched states on earth. Um, I can't say that current Britain is particularly less free than, say, modern France, which has a lot less surveillance or that it's particularly less free, free than, say, Thatcher's Britain in the 1980s, which had also less surveillance than uh, we have nowadays. Um, so it's not clear that sort of surveillance causes things to go worse. Part of the problem with looking for this is that it is extraordinarily rare for democracies to go bad. We have a few examples in minds, such as Nazi Germany, but it's very rare for them to, but it's a very rare occurrence. Um, this is freedom score, uh, just one measure of freedom um, that I found. Um, and it measures states according to their freedom from 1972, where there was considerably less surveillance, to nowadays, where there's considerably more. As you can see, there's no no real sign that states are getting less free according to this uh, metric. If we look at sort of the outcomes, so what things look like now, we see that actually freedom has been increasing in a period where surveillance has been uh, going up as well. Now, this doesn't mean that we're safe. I mean, the theoretical arguments that states with surveillance as a possibility for dictatorship or stuff like that. The theoretical arguments are somewhat convincing. But all the empirical evidence so far is that democracies tend to increase, freedoms tend to increase over time, and surveillance um, does not stop this. And then we can ask the question that even, even if surveillance did cause things to go bad, is mass surveillance going to help totalitarianism? Um, there my feelings are probably not. So even if we do fear global totalitarianism, turning to mass surveillance is still probably a good idea. But a bit more evidence and study would be good. So to summarize here, the main reason the surveillance landscape is changing is because of um, technological changes. There's a possibility for surveillance that works with the technological changes and may um, help to uh, remove most, many of the negative aspects of surveillance. Uh, mass surveillance of either sort has some positive impacts, some of them quite inspect, 
unexpected. I hadn't realized, for instance, that mass uh, surveillance could get rid of the police. Um, the important issues are the existential risks versus global totalitarianism possibilities. Um, all of the surveillances help with existential risks. Um, and it's unclear on the role of various surveillances in global totalitarianism, though surveillance is probably likely to be uh, helpful to combat it. Okay, I thank you all for your attention.